Yes. Okay, cool. I would say ladies and gentlemen, but I don't know anybody's pronouns. Um, hey, everybody, thank you for coming. At, um, oh my God, it's early uh, here at lovely Boston University. The, um, the uh, topic for today's conversation, and hopefully it will be a little bit of a conversation, um, is delegation. Um, I'm Adam Young, Cloud Solutions Architect, which means I help people build their castles in the air. I have many years as a software developer before deciding I should actually go over and talk to end users of our software. Uh, so for the past couple of years, that's what I've been doing. Um, we're going to talk about to delegate means to give to somebody the power to do something, um, a task, and trust a task, maybe multiple tasks, for somebody. And usually you're passing this on down the line. My little visual here is our delegates as they drafted our constitution. And the idea is that this is how organizations scale. This is how you can do something as big as run a country. You can't do it all yourself. You can do anything. You can't do everything. So if you need everything done, you have to give some of that to somebody else. If you have a, so here's an org chart. It doesn't really matter what the little boxes say. We all know what an org chart looks like. And up at the top of the board directors who delegates to the CEO, and eventually things get down here to the information technology department to actually execute things. So what have they delegated down? They've delegated power. They've delegated the ability to execute tasks. And this concept, this idea of delegation, um, is kind of um, ignored. You know, when we, when we talk about the, uh, the personal devices that we have here, delegation is still important, but it, it doesn't become the first class citizen that it really needs to be when we start talking about the cloud. So what I'm going to do in this talk is I'm going to take it from the, the small scale to the large scale and talk about how you can build better delegation into what you're doing. And so when I delegate to, to you the ability to do something important like drive my car, that's not my car, but it looks a lot like that one. Um, I don't give you my whole keychain, right? There's a lot of stuff on here, including um, my other car, um, the key to my house, which you don't need if you're driving my car. Um, and you certainly don't need the key to unlock my son's bicycle. What you need is the targeted delegation for the resource that you're going to be commanding. And thus, we give just enough to get the job done. The further you delegate, and I say this as a joke, uh, I love Howard's uh, artwork and his, and his stories, but the point is, is true, that if you want to feel comfortable that your organization is scaling and getting things done, you want to feel comfortable delegating on down. You want to do this in such a manner that you know that only what is necessary goes on down. Now, we don't typically do this in systems. We typically make the admin do everything uh, until we get to the point where we can get to self-service provisioning. So it's, it's kind of all or nothing. So what are we talking about in the, the realm of Linux as far as delegation? Files. Really, everything comes down to files within Linux. There's, you could say it's system calls. Um, and yeah, there's, there are a few other system calls that don't quite fall into the file category. And there's stuff like IOCA. For the vast, vast, vast majority of things, including sockets and file descriptors of all different sites, you can read, you can write, and you can execute. And that's the, the level of granularity that we have. And we can delegate this. We can assign on a specific resource, on a specific file, to a user, a group, or the world, the ability to perform one of these things. Okay, this should be a shock to no one. This is all old hat. You guys are like, why the hell am I in here? I should have gone to the containers talk. Okay. Let's 
was in your talk yesterday, right? I want to give you, and only you, the ability to read a file I wrote. How do you do that? How do you make it so that only one specific targeted user... Hello, everybody. I guess I'm going to have to start all over now. Thank you all for coming on in. I realize it's a really early thing. You've missed the drama. You missed the saxophone, although I might be a little bit of that at the end. Um, but there's enough new people in here just to do a quick catch-up. We're talking about delegation. There was a lot of big drama about the ideas of how you delegate down a hierarchy and give power to people down the bottom. Now that we're caught up, we're at the point where we're talking about file systems. Okay? Because delegation in Linux is targeted at the file. First and foremost, that's the primary resource that we have. And I'll go back one slide, and then I'll, you should be close enough to cut up. You can read, you can write, you can execute. That's the level of granularity you have on a given file, and you can say a user, me, the person who owns it, the group that owns the file, the, that the file is labeled with, or the world. And that's the, that's the, these are the rules of the game. Now, yes, I understand that in um, Linux there are capabilities. There are, are other ways of, of doing things, and you should use those too. What I'm going to do is focus on this right over the plate way that most people think about managing access because capabilities are a whole bigger thing. And yes, they exist there, and yes, you can use them. That's not what I'm going to be talking about here. I'm going to say, how do you make a better system for handling what people expect? Because the bottom line is, if people don't know that a, a feature exists, it doesn't exist. Right? So how many people here are familiar with capabilities in Linux systems? Okay, so you, there's a, we got, we, I drew a security focus and security concern group, so a uh, bit of a selection bias there. Um, good, good. Yeah, uh, and I'll treat you to, trust you to go out and read about them and be able to use it. I'm talking about, uh, for now, just the basics. And as I was saying here, I was you know, pointing a, a, a random audience member out completely randomly. Um, I want to let him read a file I wrote, and only him. How do you do that, short of? capabilities. With that granularity that we had before, the only thing that allows multi-user access and limited multi-user access is the group abstraction. Okay? Not a super powerful uh, tool, but that's the limitations that we have to work with it. Now, I can chode it. I can say, oh, he can, he can, uh, he can read it now, but at that point he owns it, at which point he can say, oh, he can no longer write to it. Or he can share it with somebody else. I don't want to give away that much power. Uh, I can change the group of it, but I have to be a member of that remote group. Okay? And in order for him to be able to use it, he's got to be a member of that remote group. And the permissions have to be such that owner has write permissions and group has read permissions. And we need a two-person group. So guess what? I have to go to the admin and say, hey, go create a two-person group. Okay. So Etsy Groups is owned by root. I have to go to the, the system administrator. And if it's you know my laptop, I am that system administrator. But then again, I'm not going to let you on my laptop. We're talking about multi-user systems here. We're talking about systems where people are going to be sharing resources. And so in the Etsy groups file, we have a group. We call it, say that this one is an example of a group called testers. No password. That's what the X means there. The group ID and then a list of the users that are in there. You can see A Young's in there. I put root in there. Cloud user. So it could come from the blah, blah, blah. Okay. So this is what I need to be able to control. Now, if I want a group like for this two things, I have to ask the, the admin to create a group, add me to it. Add you to it. All right? Now I want to add her. Or her, whichever her. I want to add somebody else to this. Okay, now I have to go back to the admin. Okay, you can see for a single file for a small resource, this is way too much overhead. If you are dealing with something, though, that you have a group forming and dynamically changing, you want to be able to add and remove members from this group yourself. The admin is going to be the bottleneck, and that's the part that we want to get away from here. So while this limited two-person group is, is maybe too small a scale to really give you a sense of the problem, 
that's, that's really the abstraction that we're talking about. So I want to be able to add a user to my group without having to ask, add an administrator. Um, so here's, here's a hack I've been thinking about for years to be able to solve this at, at this level. And I promise you, this is not the end of this. this is, I realize I'm going at a very slow pace. Um, let's create a, one file per group. Now, why don't we have this now? Speed. Right now, when the operating system has to check as a user member of a group, it can look in a single file, look it on up. But we're not talking about that end group yet. We're talking about how we would administer it. Okay, so if we create one file per group where the name of the file is the group, you can add a user to the group if you have write permissions on it. If you can write the file, you now have control of the group. But you need a utility to then take what's in this structure and update Etsy groups. Okay? Again, this is using simple abstractions, but this abstraction doesn't exist in the old Unix and now Linux uh, view of the world. And we can do the actually we can do the same thing with with Etsy hosts, right? Okay, so before we go on there, I'm going to give you a little sense of what this looks like. And I have to say, I'm feeling particularly pleased with myself because I'm doing split screen here because I have presenter view here and that there, and I couldn't figure out how I could not have to switch between that and mirror view to do it. So I'm using Tmux, and it turns out with Tmux, if I do type here, you can see it up there. So this 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 is pretty good. Now, can you see the screen up there? Is that is that too small? Very small. Let me get that one larger. I'm gonna go full screen here. See what happens when I echo is not exist. Yeah, my jokes are falling flat. Okay, so what we have here is oh, I don't have to look up there. I can look down here. Let's see, that's that's the whole point of doing it this way, isn't it? Okay, so we have this thing called group man. And um, we have an Etsy groups file. <laughs> that, you know, that has, let's, 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 let's do it with less. Okay. Now, this is usually a world readable file, as you can see. And it, the, the top half are the ones that you get when you do a basic Fedora install. And then down at the bottom, I created... At the bottom, I created a bunch of my own group. I created a group called admins. You see, Ann and Preethi are members of that. I have a bunch of users I created in the system. Jay Williams is a pain in the neck because he likes to have his, you know, his username matches email. So, uh, and, and a couple other things. So what do we do? We want to be able to then take a look at... Um, a groups file. And I have a group.d file a directory. And underneath there you can see I have a bunch of directories. So let's take the webdav group. And you, well, that's a bad one. There's nobody in webdav. Uh, admins. Right? So I want to add Adam and remove Preethi. Okay? And if we look at one of the other ones like DBA, same, similar kind of thing. Nobody there. Network. Okay. So I want to add myself to the, the network group. Now you can see, well, excuse me, not cat. Uh, uh, what am I doing wrong here? Group.d. This is why I never do live demos. It's only a member of the, So you can see I'm, I, I own this, right? So I can go into this. And so before, before I make a change there, what I want to show you is just what happens when I make the change that I, I have, have in these files pre, uh, preset. Um, uh, that's because I need to do this as root. So this utility has to be run as root because it is the thing that has the power to update the, f the file. And um, the utility could either be done as a set UID permission, in which case anybody could run it whenever they make changes, which is what you would want, but that does have the potential for abuse. The alternative, of course, is that you put it on a cron job and then there's going to be a lag. So you have to figure out what is the right method 
for your organization to be able to do it. But hopefully now this works. Let's see. CD. No? Okay, we're going to have to use our brain. So Python 3, the group man, group man, oh, I'm one level too low, let me see. I know you guys are probably going, why did we not go to the Kafka talk? Okay, so that's going to blow up because I need to give it some parameters. What am I going to give it? I'm going to tell it where my Etsy host file is. And the reason why that parameter is in there, of course, like all good things, I want to be able to test it. So I want to be able to use it on non-production workloads. And, um, and then I need to say where my data directory is. Okay. And what is it? Oh, that's the host. Yeah, you can tell what I'm used to. I'm glad I didn't. Oh, wow, that would have been bad. Okay, so what did I just do? You can't really see much of anything, right? Well, I actually kept a previous copy of it. So what I'm going to show you is, first of all, what it looks like now. And you can remember, it was nice and pretty before and, and all that. Where did all that other stuff go? Oh, guess what? It doesn't in alphabetical order. So you can see in the middle, aside from Preethi's groups and Jay Williams and all that kind of stuff, there's that web dev group I created, the DBA group. Andre, Pat, and Randy are in there. Now, they stayed in there because, remember, those files were empty. So I only want to be able to make changes. I don't want to go in. I don't want that to necessarily have to be the canonical thing. I can. I can leave them all in their plus format. But really, what I want to say is this is my way of making changes. So you can see that for each line there, there's a plus and there was a minus, right? So now these groups exist. Um, and Arthur, William, Preethi... Uh, they're all members of WebDAV. WebDAV. So if we go into our data directory here, group.d and WebDAV, and we're going to say, I'm going to add myself, we're going to remove Preethi, because Preethi is no longer doing WebDAV. Okay, and we run that again, and it blew up. Hmm. All right, well, let's screw something up. Um, I have a feeling it has to do with the, the data that I just put in there. Very, very new code here. This was really done as a, um, a proof of concept. Let's, let's see. This way you do everything and get. Okay, I'm going to go back there and make sure. We're, oh, it's still blowing up. Okay. Hmm, okay. Well, ran once, ran the first time, right. So you get the general idea. Sorry for wasting your time with a, a poor demo. But the whole idea, was that up there like this the whole time? That just happened when I switched on over. Okay, good. Um, so you get the idea. The, and, and better coders than me and people with more time to put in this could make into a utility that would actually be useful. But you can understand the concept, right? Yes, no? Okay. The, I, I wanted to do a proof of concept. Actually, I originally started writing it as a way to learn Rust. I have one for doing Etsy hosts in, uh, in Rust. Um, I decided I was trying to learn the library to do um, group management. It was too much to do, and I actually have a day job that doesn't allow me to spend as much time coding on this as I want to. But the whole idea is that the two most important um, resources that you have in distributed computing users, or the groupings of users, and the host that they can have access to are things that you should be able to control. Now, um, when I look at the Etsy hosts type delegation, um, one of the things I realize is you only want to limit it to a subdomain. So I want to create a subdomain like, you know, uh, younglogic.com, create preethi.younglogic.com, and preethi can manage that. Any, um, any uh, host that she adds underneath that subdomain is, is, are on her. Okay, so, and that gets into the whole question about what do we do for more than one computer? Okay. Now, um, how many people here have created a user's table for an application that they've written? Okay. So we have one honest person and a bunch of people who either are liars or have not had to write that much code yet. It's annoying. 
that we have this concept that the users are owned by the application, where when you get out into the real world, that's not the case. You don't own the user database. The user database, for whatever reason, is owned by Active Directory. It's owned by some directory structure, LDAP, out there, that you are then going to consume. And you're going to get this information through a variety of sources, but the thing to remember is that you don't own the set of users, and that's okay. Because what you really want to focus on is what groups are those users in. Okay? So, LDAP. I spent a lot of time with LDAP. How many people here know what LDAP, LDAP is? Okay. How many people here don't know what LDAP is? Okay. LDAP stands for Lightweight Directory Access Protocol. And the word that you should take out of that is directory. Okay? Because a lot of times we'll talk about an LDAP server, and that's just a server that serves a certain protocol. Well, that's kind of mess. Not mess. Why is it lightweight? Because there was a heavier weight one before. Okay, so really, and protocols for accessing things, so really it's directories. And what is a directory? Remember that, that big graph I showed you at the beginning with the CEO in the middle and the, all that? That's a directory. It is a database, a hierarchical database that holds information about an organization. And the most important thing it holds is the set of users that are in that organization. I worked on a project called Free IPA, which was an attempt to take... Um, a directory and make it more usable and easily more easily installed. And so the example that I'm showing a little bit makes use of that. But what we're talking about here is really generic. Anything where you're talking about users, the users are going to come in from a web app. Now say you're in an organization that's using Kerberos. How many people here know what Kerberos is? Okay. For the two or three people who did not raise their hands, um, Kerberos is a way of authenticating yourself that is actually secure as opposed to handing your password across the open internet, which is what a lot of us still do because that's what a lot of systems allow. So any organization that has tried to lock down security has looked at different mechanisms, and Kerberos is one of the ones that uh, a lot of them use. came from right across the river. It's an MIT project, Project Athena, and it uses symmetric cryptography. So I take a secret and I encrypt it, and if you have that same that same key that I used to encrypt it, you can decrypt it. And that's how you prove that you are who you are. So you have this key sharing that goes on there. So in an enterprise, in a big place using Kerberos, you, you, you log on with Kerberos. And you identify yourself to some system using this mechanism. And then that application is going to say, okay, now that I know, you know, Preeti's here, now that I know that Adam's here, what groups are they in? And from that set of groups, I'm going to use this to apply permissions in this application. There's going to be two to three groups that really apply maximum. For a given application, I really want to know, are you an administrator of this? Are you a user of this system? Or are you just a read-only browser? There may be more. There are often more. Um, it may be more granular per resources. But understanding when you have a centralized re repository like LDAP, you can't get super granular in what permissions a user can or cannot have for each application because, again, you're, you're pushing off to the centralized admin to be able to control it. But what you can do and what we see in a lot of organizations now is this idea of two levels of LDAP server. Okay? This gives you... How many people here are running labs or running groups of computers separate from, like, the main organization that they're in? How many people have, like, their home lab or... Okay. This, or, or how many people here work in perhaps like a graduate lab or something like that in, in, uh, in grad school or something like that? Okay. That's another example. You often have this idea of a limited domain where you need to be able to manage permissions for people in there, but you still need to consume from one level up. So what you have is what's called an AD trust or a Kerberos trust between the two. Same idea where you're going to manage the list of users centrally, people who are students of a university, people who are faculty at the university, people who are um, somewhere in between. But what you want to do is be able to manage this set of servers, these hundred machines, and once we start talking virtual machines, perhaps thousands of machines, with a centralized to your lab LDAP server, but still consume it from higher up. Once you do this, then you can say, okay, there are more interesting groups that I can put people into. But you understand what I'm saying? Put people into it. I'm, I'm back to talking centralized. I'm back to talking about what I can do as an administrator, and that's not what we want to do. 
What do we want to do? We want to be able to delegate. So we want this idea of group managers. And so the major shift that you have to make is thinking the group itself is a resource. And just like we were doing files at the Linux level, I want to make the groups within the directory manageable by people other than the administrator. Okay? And what's neat about LDAP as a, as a directory protocol, unlike a SQL database, I don't just limit on the table level what permissions I have. I label on the specific object who can do what. In fact, I can go down to even just a field. I can say on this field here, Preethi can modify it. But anybody else can just read. And then the whole overall object, well, that has to be an administrator to create. So to create the group, you have to be an admin. But to add or remove users from the group, I want to modify, in this case, um, the member field of a group object. This is a very standard structure in LDAP that you have uh, these things. And so I'm using the IPA command because actually modifying permissions within LDAP is one of the things that varies from LDAP server to LDAP server. And this is the one that I know and that I, I work with. Once you do something like this, now I created a, um, a group called the Beowulf Manage Group. And, um, uh, excuse me, I created a target group called Beowulf and a permission, Beowulf Manage Group a permission, which allows people to, in that group, to write the member field. So people who are members of the Beowulf group can manage the Beowulf group. And you can tell what I was doing, what I was thinking about when I did this stuff, not uh, old English fantasy, but uh, Beowulf clusters. Right. Now what I have is the ability to say, okay, for any resource I have out there, I'm going to create a group in LDAP. I'm going to create a permission for that group, and I'm assigned the people who I want to manage that group that permission, and then they can figure out who's coming in there. Because it might be hundreds of thousands of users from that centralized LDAP. Perhaps we're talking about a graduate lab where you have, you know, 500 people working in there with 100 of them changing each year. This is the kind of thing that you want to be able to have the lab manager handle, not the centralized admin. So that's the way we're thinking about things, okay? I want to talk a little bit about the domain model of role-based access control before we go on. And um, uh, I can't remember where I first saw this. It's called the party pattern. I want to say it was out of a Martin Fowler book. I know Martin talks about it. I don't know if that's the first place I saw it. But it's a great way to think about the relationship between people, groups of people, and permissions. So you notice at the top I have uh, the role assignment in bold. This is the, and it has a start date and end date. Okay. This is the idealized case. Your systems may not have all this way of doing things, but it may. And once you have a role assignment, that means you have a role. And for a given role in a given organization, that allows you to perform an action on resources owned by that organization. Okay? Let me put this, you know, a little bit more concretely. If I'm a member of the lab organization, and I have the manager role, so I have the role assignment of manager on the lab, then I can boot the computers in the lab. The action is boot, the resource is computers. Now, the majority of what we deal with now is the web. We're dealing with uh, resources that are exposed via web APIs. And how many people here know what REST stands for? Okay. How many people here don't know what REST stands for but know what REST is? Okay. Um, yeah, it's something state representational, something representational, something state transformed. It's basically using the web protocol the way the web protocol was designed to be used. And in this, you have resources and actions, just like we had in our domain model. And the resource is a URL. A resource is the name. The URL is the name of the resource, because guess what this stands for? A universal resource locator. It's not, it's not random. And here's a handful of the actions that you can do against one of these resources. You can post, you can get, you can put, you can delete. Now, I put down here about XML or JSON RPC is not REST, but you can usually map to it. There are a bunch of other ways of using hypertext protocol to access and to control and to manage resources. 
And a lot of them don't use this general thing, but you can think about them that way. If you look at free IPA again, it was JSON RPC, and there's an action for verb in, in the payload. So you can't do it at the URL level, but you can do it at the payload level. There's a way of being able to map it. But hopefully when you're designing APIs now, when you're designing systems now, you're thinking REST. And you're thinking in these terms, because this is the least surprise. Okay? So when you start thinking of permissions, you want to think, who can perform the post action on the specific URL that I have there? And we go back to LDAP. What we're going to do is we're going to get enough information to figure out that decision. Now, I want to talk a bit about OpenStack Keystone, which is the system that I worked on for a long, long time where we made use of this. How many people here have heard of Keystone? One. Okay. How many people here have heard of OpenStack? A little bit more. Okay. How many people have not heard of OpenStack? Okay. OpenStack was a effort to provide a standardized method of doing what EC2 was doing at Amazon, creating virtual machines in somebody else's cloud. Amazon went from being a bookseller to the world's largest data center management company. Um, and EC2, this, this, this elastic cloud protocol, or set of protocols, was one of the ways that they were able to do it. It is a way of telling Amazon's data center to turn on turn off, create, destroy virtual machines for you. It does a lot of other stuff too, but that's the heart of it. Keystone was a piece of, uh, of OpenStack that kind of fragmented off to do access control management, separate from all the other things that you can do in a data center. It was, when you create a virtual machine, you have three big things to work with. You have compute, the memory, you have storage, the disk that it stores things to or reads things from, and you have networking. And those all became separate, I'm not, I don't want to call them microservices, they're not really macro services or monoliths, they're just kind of services, they're just blobs there that do things, and some of them do more, some of them do less, and they're complicated, and what we wanted is we wanted the networking folks to focus on networking, and we wanted the storage folks to focus on storage, and we wanted the access control people to focus on access control between all of those, and Keystone was that piece. And so with Keystone, we had to deal with a REST API or a set of REST APIs that are provided for managing the data center in the large. And again, they wrote a user table. And that's, that's when I joined the project. And I'm like, you don't own the user table. Users are in LDAP. And the project leader looked at me and said, LDAP? Who uses LDAP anymore? And he came from Google. They don't, you know, they don't do things the way that the rest of the world does. And maybe they're right, but we're not there yet. Uh, but when I said, look, the users should exist somewhere else, he's like, yeah. I, I didn't actually want this thing here. I was forced to build it. So we were kind of in agreement, and that's how I got involved in Keystone, by doing LDAP integration into Keystone way back when. And as I said, it's web-based. It's, it's a REST API. It became more of a REST API as we went over time. That's why it's version 3. 2 was a little bit less so. And it can consume LDAP or federated identities. And what do I mean by federated identities? Well, Remember that whole Kerberos thing I talked about that nobody here had actually heard of, or a lot of people hadn't heard of? There are other things like that. How many people here have heard of OpenID Connect? Okay, how many people here have used Twitter? Okay, so we have at least a couple liars out there. Everybody's used Twitter. Some of us are willing to admit it more than others. No, I'm kidding. Oh, I know. <laughs> I see the look of absolute disgust there. Um, we've at least been put on web pages where somebody has embedded a tweet from somewhere else on there. And what's interesting about Twitter is it had this need to be able to, just like we were talking about in OpenStack, different services talk to each other, have a, a bunch of microservices or maybe just services and centralized authentication. They need a way to be able to share it. The same kind of delegation that we're talking about here. So there's a standardized protocol for sharing delegation, only we usually think of it as an authentication protocol, and it's called OAuth. And OAuth 1, and then 1A, and then 2 is this thing that grew out of Twitter's need to be able to manage microservices together. So you've probably used OpenID Connect. You may not have been aware that you're using it. If you go into Launchpad, which is the, um, like the bug tracker and stuff like that for Ubuntu and Canonical and all that kind of stuff, uh, 
when you go to comment on a bug, it's going to kick you off to a page where you log in and then kick you back to the bug page. That's OpenID Connect going on there. Okay. There's another protocol like this called SAML, Security Assertion Markup Language. It's very similar to OpenID Connect, except it's an XML. But they all do the same thing. You go over here and authenticate and prove your identity, and then it's going to give something cryptographically signed that you can hand over here and say, hey, look, I just proved my identity over there. Okay? These are called federated protocols. And groups can be managed. Um, excuse me. Uh, and and, and I, so the, the, uh, the, the systems that we're talking about are going to consume these identity, the identities from these federated protocols when you log in. But the neat thing, again, to remember is that the groups can be managed separately from the groups that are in these assertions. We use the term assertion. Why don't you go and uh, authenticate against uh, OpenID Connect? It doesn't just give you the identity, the, the name of who you are. It says the set of groups that you're in or attributes about you. But groups can also be managed at many, many levels anywhere in between here, and that's where your power comes from. Now, when we get into Keystone, we're, we're back in an RBAC format. RBAC stands for Role-Based Access Control. I apologize for using the acronym before defining it. A role gets assigned to a user based on the groups. So you can have groups that you consume from LDAP and use that to do access control. And eventually this gets down to the point where you're saying, okay, can he do a put on the URL that allows you to create a virtual machine? Now, I put this number in here because this is a case of where people mess things up. And there's a bug in Keystone that makes this kind of safe delegation that I'm talking about really hard to do. It's 968696. I actually figured out what the tones were and wrote a song about it. This is a long-standing bug. This is how to not do things right. This is how to very much not do things right. And this is also goes to show the proof of the old adage that programming is like sex, which is if you make one mistake, you might be supporting it for the rest of your life. Um, and this is a case of a bug that was built in very early on, and we've been battling ever since. The idea if, you're, if you don't have at proper access control enforced all the way down at the right level, you can't do proper delegation, and it messes up the system. But assuming you can get around that kind of bug, then you could do, and what I have here highlighted in black is some of the code that you would actually implement, that is actually implementing Keystone, that does allow you to say, if you're a manager of a given project, if you have the manager or the admin role, in this case, on the project, or you're some sort of global admin, because you need that for break the glass capabilities, then you have what's called a create a grant. And this, this again, will map to the, the URL. So you have the ability to add users to your projects. This is the way you should be thinking about things when you're building your systems, okay? I want to be able to do role-based access control. I want to be able to create some grouping mechanism, and I want to be able to give somebody ownership of that grouping mechanism so that they can control it, and then I can go off and whatever it is you do to waste time. I don't know. Uh, you can go off and not spend your days adding and removing users from the groups, and in doing so, they can then get their job done without bothering you, and you won't screw up their getting their job done, and everybody's happier, and this is how organizations scale. Kubernetes. Everybody heard of Kubernetes? Okay. In Kubernetes, in, in Red Hat, Kubernetes is spelled like this. It's a system built around Kubernetes, but Kubernetes is the core. And one of the interesting things about the Red Hat interaction with Kubernetes is that we needed role-based access control, and it didn't exist. So we worked on it at midstream. Still open source, but not in upstream Kubernetes, because we wanted to make sure we got it right. And we had iterations with people on this. And once we had an open source RBAC system for Kubernetes, we contributed it back to the, the core. And it is now part of core Kubernetes. So the same way of managing things I just talked about for Keystone, for OpenStack, that exists in Kubernetes. And guess what? There's no bugs, 968696. So it actually is. And it has the advantage of always going through a single API server. Whenever you make a change in Kubernetes, you're going to a single point, And thus, you don't have this whole problem of, I have to make a change in Nova and Neutron and, and, and Glance and all the different projects that make up OpenStack. So by having a single point of authentication, and this is, the, this is the value of, how many people here have been in any of like the service mesh um, talks and stuff like that and talk about Kubernetes? When you have a single place where you administer your policy, a, a centralized policy management scheme, then you have the ability to fix things much, much more, more quickly, okay? Including big bugs like this, okay? So with um, 
uh, OAdmin is the OpenShift admin API. And there's a couple different ways to do this. There's a more per pure cube control way to do it, but this is the one that I had from my example that I know works. You add a role to a group for a group name. So you can just, a, a lot of people will use the add role to user and manage users directly, but if you're consuming groups from LDAP, then you can do it the same way there. And then if you're using LDAP as your mechanism to manage your um, membership, you can centralize it. And that way you could actually share that group. It might not just be for Kubernetes. It might also be used on the storage side. It might also be used for your software-defined networking. So you can consume it here, but you don't necessarily have to manage it here. Very, very powerful concept. Give power to the people who have to get things done. Um, as I said before, users and groups almost always come from federated identity, from external OpenID Connect. In, um, when you set up Kubernetes, there's a, a concept of uh, identity providers. OIDC, Open ID Connect, is, the, is kind of the expected way that you can do it. It's a first-class citizen. It's actually written in Go. But you can actually wrap the Kubernetes web server with, like, Apache and use what's called request header. And then you can do Kerberos or SAML or whatever other protocols that you come in there that are handled at that level. But the bottom line is some... Or, and you can even do direct LDAP integration. But the identity, the users come from, from outside, and all you have to deal with is consuming them. How much, how much are we over time? Three minutes? Okay. Um, so this is my takeaway slide, my, my last slide. So I'm going to leave this up here. You don't own the list of users, but you really want to make it possible for people to manage their own groups. Okay? I've talked through a couple mechanisms here. Um, I'll, on the last page, I'll leave a slide to my proof of concept code. Somebody can figure out what I did wrong so, during the demo. Um, but to be able to manage the set of users in which group, be able to push that on down, this is how organizations scale. Um, there are absolutely no time for questions. Thank you.